It's a pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Steve Potter. And Steve competed with MSD uh, in astrophysics at Queen Mary University in London, and then went on to do his PhD studies in optical and X-ray studies of intermediate polars of the Mayer Space Science Laboratory of the University College London. And after that, in 1998, Nine, he actually took up a postdoctoral fellowship at the SAO here, and that became a permanent staff astronomer position in 2004. And he has quite a few duties besides research, which includes support astronomer, instrument scientist, and software development. He is an author or co-author of more than a hundred publications in refereed journals and most in the area of accreting closed binary stars, including cataclysmic variables and X-ray binaries, and recently on the interstellar medium. And since 2012, he has served on the SAO executive as the head of astronomy division. He is an NIF B-rated scientist, and he currently holds a visiting professorship at the University of Johannesburg. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Christian. Um, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today, um, particularly because it's a science topic. I'm, I seem to be more and more giving presentations about project reports and things like that and budgets and things. So it's, it's a great opportunity here to talk some science for a change. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And for you to come along and, sh and show your interest. So as the title says, uh, I'd like to talk to you about this discovery of a rare type of uh, spinning white dwarf star in a binary star system. So the key Hello, words- Hello, Chris. I'm trying to get some audio at this end. Peter Cram here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, shall I continue? <laughs> okay, so the key words in this title are rare type. Um, so th this is what we're going to go on to. And, um, so to yeah. set the context of what I mean about rare type um, in the context of binary star systems, uh, so let me set the background first, just one slide of what we're talking about. So then you realize as we go through the talk, why this is a particularly rare type of system. Um, so we're talking about binary star systems and in particular uh, binary systems that contain a normal M dwarf star. So M dwarf stars are like our sun, but they're they're somewhat smaller, maybe 10% of the size of our sun, up to about 50% of our sun, size of our sun. And the other star is, uh, the, the primary star is a white dwarf star. And a white dwarf star is about a mass of the sun, but um, has the size, about the size of the earth. So it's a white dwarf star is a very compact, uh, and it's, they're basically fossil remains of, uh, uh, stars like our sun. So our sun will eventually end up as a white dwarf. Uh, so it's a very compact star. Uh, so are they, are they estimate a teaspoon of white dwarf material weighs about 15 tons. Okay, so it's a very compact star. And they generally have a variety of magnetic field strengths as well. Um, so here's three figures. Sorry, I don't know how to get rid of the Zoom session there. <laughs> well, I can't even see my mouse. No, it's on my moment. It's on my laptop, oh, it's, Christian. It's not. Oh, so you can minimize it there. Yeah, I can't see my mouse though. That's the problem. I think we're going to have to live with it. Um, so here's an example of three types of binary systems that contain an M dwarf star and a white dwarf star. These kind of fall under the general category of cataclys cataclysmic variables. So I'm sure of you have used cataclysmic variables before, uh, but it's when these there's two these two types of stars together in a, in a binary system. 
and they typically take uh, three, four, five, up to 10 hours to make one complete orbit around each other. And they come in various uh, flavors and uh, their flavors generally depend on how strong the magnetic field is on the primary white dwarf star. So some of these white dwarf stars have a relatively weak magnetic field, as in the top uh, example. So there, um, oh, by the way, the two stars are so close to each other that the M dwarf star, uh, the white dwarf star, is pulling material off the red dwarf star. So you can see it falls off in a kind of a stream and then forms an accretion disk around the white dwarf star. So that material slowly spirals in through the accretion disk, eventually impacting on the, on the white dwarf surface, on the equator region of the white dwarf surface. And that's a very bright, hot region, that region on the white dwarf surface. Uh, but then if you start increasing the magnetic field of the white dwarf, you get systems like this one on the bottom right, where the inner part of the disk has been carved out by the magnetic field of the rotating white dwarf. So instead of the material spiraling onto the equator of the white dwarf, at some radius, it feels the magnetic field of the white dwarf, and that accreting material instead follows the magnetic field lines down onto the magnetic poles of the white dwarf. Uh, so on these very close to the magnetic, magnetic poles of the white dwarf, you get these very hot uh, extremely hot regions that emit in X-rays and optical, and, and they're very bright there. So those impact regions on the white dwarf actually outshine the combined brightness of the two stars combined, okay, the very high energy events. And then you get uh, on the bottom left, when the magnetic of the field strength of the white dwarf is so high that it actually prevents the formation of an accretion disk entirely. In other words, as soon as material leaves the M dwarf star, it attaches to the magnetic field of the white dwarf straight away, follows the magnetic field lines, and crashes down onto one or both magnetic poles of the white dwarf. And, it, and, it, uh, and that's how most of these systems were discovered, was through the X-ray emissions. Okay? And so these are, of course, artist representations of what we think these systems look like through different sets of observations. And, and reality, you know, they this is a, an image <laughs> of one of these systems, which just like, looks like a normal star, right? Even with the most powerful telescopes in the world, we can't resolve what these look like. So all these um, different types of uh, um, CVs, uh, this is how we think they look like through other indirect methods of, of observing. Okay, so these are catacomic variables. We know of thousands of these, and these, these, are, these are quite common. So this new system, well, actually not the newest one. Um, the one I'm about to talk about is the second um, one discovered, but the first one discovered was called AR Skull, and it was only discovered back in 2016. And it was actually recognized by uh, amateur astronomers. Um, so this, this system was first incorrectly identified as a completely different type of system. It was called a Delta, Delta Scuti star. And that type of star is basically a, a single star that oscillates a lot and it's through its oscillations that its brightness varies. But amateurs were following the star for many years, and they, they pointed out that the oscillations are um, they're too quick and too sharp to be a Delta Scuti star. So it was followed up with more intense observations um, through larger telescopes. And, and it was discovered to be slightly unusual. So, um, uh, so so it was firstly discovered that it was a white dwarf and an M dwarf secondary star, just like the systems I just described. The two stars go around each other in just under four hours. So again, nothing different there. That's the same as a CV. Uh, but there were also two other pulsations detected in it as well, of 117 seconds and 118 seconds. So the 117 seconds is thought to be the spin period of the white dwarf. Every 117 seconds, 
the white dwarf would do one spin. And 118 seconds comes about because there's a beat frequency between the spin and the orbit. So that's just a mathematical consequence of two frequencies. Okay, so so far, so 117 seconds is a bit fast for a spinning white dwarf, but it's not terribly unusual. So um, it's not unusual yet, but then with more further up, observa further more observations, it was discovered that these modulations were detec detected right across the electromagnetic spectrum. So those pulses, those 117 second pulses were seen in the radio wavelengths, all the way through UV, optical, and even X-rays. And because it was also detected in a radio, which is very unusual for a, a white dwarf binary system, it was originally classified as a white dwarf radio pulsar in a binary system. So it's called a radio pulsar after the so-called neutron star pulsars. So we've known about neutron star pulsars since the 1960s, and they're very well-known radio sources of pulses, but not white dwarfs before. So they were now beginning to think, is this the first type of pulsar where the radio pulses are coming from a white dwarf rather than a neutron star? And the other unusual observation about this was the emission lines, the optical emission lines from the system were single peaked. And in those other objects that I showed you earlier, the emission lines are generally uh, multiple peaked as a result of emission from accretion disks and the two stars and the accretion streams and the impact regions. There was no sign of that in this system. So this system clearly, there was no sign of accretion in this system, whereas those common ones we showed you earlier, that there's accretion going on in there. Um, yeah, so that that's why it was an unusual and the first of its kind. Uh, so let me show you some observational properties. Um, I don't know why my mouse isn't working, but if you look at the, on the left plot at the, the green light curve, um, this is taken from the WHT telescope, the William Herschel telescope in the Palmer. And the green curve shows the kind of general trend there is the orbital period. So the green curve is about five hours in total. So you can see this kind of the, that observation covered about one orbit. But superimposed on that, you can see those vertical lines going up quite quick. And then to the right of the green curve, you can see a zoomed in section. The zoomed in is indicated by those dashed lines. You can see the zoomed in section there onto those pulses. You can see the pulse behavior in the optical. And then on the bottom left is the equivalent radio light curve. And you can see the radio pulses are also double peaked. Um, so it's basically showing those pulses there are two of them every 117 seconds. So each pulse is about a one minute. Uh, so it's a double pulsed. Uh, each spin of the white dwarf gives two pulses. Um, and then later in a later publication, the plot on the right shows that the pulses also occur in the X-ray region as well. So for this system, uh, given these observations so far, it was theorized that this emission, the whole emission from radio all the way through to x-rays was of synchrotron origin. Um, and so synchrotron emission is a result of particles being accelerated close to the speed of light. And then and those, those accelerated particles, they emit what's called synchrotron emission because they are close to the speed of light. And when you get accelerating charged particles approaching the speed of light, they will emit synchrotron emission, okay? Um, what they were also able to do was, um, as I said, the white dwarf has a spin period of 117 seconds, but over a period of a few years, they found that the white dwarf spin period is actually decreasing. And uh, so then that's kind of implying that the uh, the energy source to produce the synchrotron emission is being taken from the spinning white dwarf. 
Okay, so to accelerate particles to close to the speed of light, you need an energy source of some sort. And as the white dwarf is slowing down, and that's where the energy is being taken from, from the spinning white dwarf. Okay, so now, um, so that paper came out in Nature in 2016 by uh, some collaborators of us in the UK. So about a month later, well, we realized because as I said, the emission is synchrotron emission. One thing about synchrotron emission is that it's highly polarized. Um, so polarized light is, uh, I don't think we quick primer on what polarimetry is. <laughs> okay, so we're all familiar with light in terms of when you look at light, you can see that it, it can be bright, bright or faint. Okay, it has an amplitude which basically it's, it's intensity, it's bright or faint. Our eyes can detect variations in brightness of light. The other thing that our eyes can detect is the wavelength of light or its frequency. And our eyes distinguish different frequencies by seeing different colors, okay? Another characteristic of light, which we cannot see with our eyes, is its polarization nature. Now, polar, the polarized nature of light is just simply the orientation of the light. So you know that light travels in a straight line, um, but if you think of light in the old classical way of an electromagnetic wave, then the polarization of that light is basically the orientation of that light as it comes towards you. Um, so if it's coming towards you like this in a vertical direction, it's polarized in that direction. Okay, if it's coming in this direction, it's polarized in that direction. Now, as we look around the room, the light is generally not polarized because uh, it's the summation of a lot of light with lots of random directions. Mm. So the net polarization is basically zero. But there are some cases in nature where light conspires to be all aligned in the same direction. And there are instances of that on Earth. Uh, so the natural cases, for example, light reflecting off the surface of, uh, of a lake. Okay, when you look down at a lake, you can see the reflected sky off the surface of the lake, right? And that, that light, that reflected light is polarized. And you can eliminate the light by wearing polarized glasses. Mm -hmm and it will take out that reflected light and you can see underwater. So that's an example of polarized light. And also um, a more unnatural form of polarized light is a light that comes off your laptops. These liquid crystal displays use the polarized nature of light to change the color of the pixels. So if you have a pair of polarized sunglasses, next time have a look at your, your laptop or even your phone, and rotate the phone, and you'll see that the screen can can possibly completely disappear at some angles. Mm. Okay, so that's that's a deliberate alignment of all the light in the same direction. So, back to the astrophysics. So, out in the universe, there are um, systems, the uh, um, uh, astrophysical systems that will make polarized light. And in Sutherland, on one of our telescopes in Sutherland, we have an instrument that will detect polarized light. And so going back to this system, uh, ARSCO, because it was theorized that the emission is synchrotron emission, it's known that synchrotron emission is actually highly polarized. And it's highly polarized because all of those particles that were accelerating and emitting in the light, they're all accelerating in the same direction. So they will all emit the light in one in the one same direction. Okay. So this is what a light curve, one of the light curves looks like from the, the, the instrument in Sutherland. Uh, so on the top, um, this is about, it's about six hours. The black curve on top is about six hours of normal photometry. So this is just a record over time of the variation in brightness. And um, so again, you, can, you can't quite see yet because it's all scrunched up, but you can see there's one 
overall orbital variation in there, but there's also lots of vertical uh, excursions in there as well. This instrument also detects polarization. So on the lower plot is the simultaneous measurement of polarization in percent. So on this, you can see uh, in the on the blue points, you can see, again, there's a kind of orbital modulation going on there. Uh, but there's also a mess in there somewhere as well, right? Uh, but if you look at the y-axis, it's kind of suggesting the polarization goes up to 40% at some part of the orbit. So this is actually, uh, this is highly polarized. In most astrophysical sources, when we're doing polarimetry, we're lucky to detect three or four or 5%, but this system is going up to a whopping 40%. So the, the synchrotron emission from this system is dominating the combined brightness on the two stars. Okay, so in the next plot, I'm just gonna zoom in into that region highlighted by the, the blue rectangle. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you can see on the top is the intensity pulses and on the bottom are the is the linear polarization. So you can see each one of those pulses is linearly polarized and is tracing the normal intensity pulses as well. Um, so in the next plot, I'm gonna show you the next cool thing about polarimetry. So remember, Polarimetry, it's not just about how, what percentage of the light is all conspired to be in the same direction, but polarization also tells you the angle at which that light is arriving towards you. Um, so in the next plot, the lower plot underneath is the simultaneous measurement of the angle of polarization. So if you look at the Y axis, you can see it goes from zero to 100 degrees. And if you follow one of those pulses, it starts at about almost close to zero. And as the pulse increases in intensity, it goes up to almost 180 degrees. So during the course of this pulse, the rotate the rotation of polarization has turned by 180 degrees, which therefore means that in this system AR SCO, whatever is emitting that synchrotron emission that whole emitting region has rotated by 180 degrees. So now this makes sense. It must be attached to the white dwarf somehow. This synchrotron emission is attached to the white dwarf. And as the white dwarf rotates, uh, the synchrotron emission rotates with it. Okay, so the, the blue rectangle um, shows one spin of the white dwarf, okay? And we have two pulses for one spin. And you can imagine we have two pulses because there's probably two magnetic poles on the white dwarf. So each one has its own synchrotron emission region, okay? The other thing as well, if you remember the previous plot, these pulses are also varying on the orbital period. They're not the same pulse all the time. So there's some other ingredient that's causing the pulses to change as a function of orbital period. And um, the easiest way to show that is um, if you look at the figure on the top left, this is a color diagram that's showing how the spin pulse intensity varies over the orbital period. So the dashed line marked by the red arrow, that dashed line, if you extract the intensity across there, that's the the pulses that you will get in the black curve, okay? So then as you follow the spin pulse as it goes vertically in that top left plot, you can see at orbital phases around 0.4, the pulses are the strongest. But later in the orbit around 1.0, the pulses are quite faint. And in fact, they've shifted in phase a bit as well. So, so this is another peculiar characteristic, right? It's the pulses, are, they're locked on the white dwarf, but the brightness of the pulses depends on what our viewing angle is to the system, right? The orbital period is basically, is changing to our line of sight. Um, and that's total intensity. We can do the same for the linear polarization as well. So when you look at the, the bottom left figure, you can see, the pulses 
the structure of the pulses change, not just as a function of spin phase, but as orbital phase as well. There's all these features where they're kind of diagonal and there's a couple regions of high intensity. So this is what we need to explain, like what, what in the underlying in physical system produces this sort of behavior. Um, there's also circular polarimetry, but we, you can ask me questions about that later if you, <laughs> if you want to know what circular polarimetry is. And then finally, this is a plot of the angle of polarization again. The key thing to take away from it is from this plot is okay, it's again color coded. So blue is zero degrees angle going up to red, which is 180 degrees angle. Okay. Um, and the difference between the spin phase and the beat phase is showing that because the, uh, if you look at the spin phase diagram, because those features look vertical in this plot, this means that it's evidence that the polarization is locked to the white dwarf. Okay, and it's not on the beat phase. Remember the beat phase is another frequency that's a combination of spin and orbit. Yeah. It's not vertical there, so it's not on the beat phase. Uh, that's an important thing because it rules out uh, lots of other models and theories. Um, it has to be coming from the white dwarf. Steve, yeah? on the previous slide, you've got this two, you've got a lot of red dots in, in the white area. But in the middle, you've got a faint red. What is that? Is that the low amplitude? Uh, so yeah, they, that, that's they, a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So you, you're one. talking about this area here? Yes. So this area. Yeah, so I think this is the two pulses. So that's one spin of the white dwarf there. Yeah. And these are the two pulses, each from each of the magnetic poles of the, of the white dwarf. So we think there's two emission regions on the white dwarf. <clears throat> so over one rotation, going from there to there, you will get two pulses. So this one's fainter is just probably showing us that the other pole is fainter than the other pole. So it's, it's not as strong as the... It's either it's not as strong or it's a viewing angle preference for, oh, for yeah. us as well, because our binary system has an inclination uh, to us. Thank you. Now I understand. Okay, so um, this is an artist impression of what they think they thought AR SCO looks like before we got our polarimetry measurements. So they reasoned that because of the radio emission, um, it's similar to those radio pulsars from neutron stars. And in those systems where uh, you have a white dwarf which is spinning and it has a strong magnetic field, um, relativistic particles will be accelerated from the surface of the white dwarf out through the magnetic poles. So those outgoing um, relativistic particles will emit the synchrotron emission. And as the white dwarf rotates, every time that synchrotron emission is pointing at us, we'll get a bright flash of light. And then, you know, and then the second pole comes around and we get another flash of light, okay? Um, the problem is with this model is it does not explain that orbital variation that we've also seen in the optical polarimetry. Okay, this would imply that the pulses will be the same whatever the orbital um, phase is. It shouldn't vary over orbital phase at all because this is purely coming from the white dwarf. I hasn't taken into account that there's another star nearby. Okay, so we went to the drawing board and thought, right, how, how can we um, explain those observations I just showed you just now? So we know it's synchrotron emission. So we thought, so I'm only going to show you what we finally found. This is <laughs> this diagram is after uh, lots of models that just did not work. So we're going to just cut straight to the uh, to the chase. Okay. So we reasoned that because there's a, another star in this system, in, we thought instead of the material being accelerated out from the white dwarf, what about instead if the magnetic field of the white dwarf, as it's sweeping past that other red dwarf, it's grabbing material off that 
red dwarf into its own magnetic field and accelerating that material um, as the white dwarf rotates. Okay, it's grabbing it with magnetic field and then accelerating those particles to relativistic speeds. So those particles would then would then fall down and accelerate towards the magnetic poles of the white dwarf. Okay. And as they approach the magnetic poles of the white dwarf, the magnetic field lines start to converge and get compressed. And uh, they form what's called a, um, I forget the word now, um, bottle neck, B bottleneck, uh, but there's a proper word for it in magnetism. I can't remember what it is, but it's a uh, when the magnetic field lines converge, charged particles will fall down the field and they will feel this converging magnetic field and they will bounce at the point where the field lines have converged too much and then they will spiral back up the magnetic fields. And so those charged particles will bounce back and forth between the magnetic mirror points of the magnetic field of the white dwarf. Okay, so if we... If we right, if we take that into account, right, the material is falling onto the magnetic field lines. So this kind of cyan triangle I've drawn there is the accelerated, the decelerating particles now as they turn around at the magnetic mirror point. And that big green globe is the resulting direction in which the synchrotron emission is going to emanate. Okay, so this is a simple model. And then if we rotate this white dwarf, as our point of view changes to the white dwarf, if we're to the left of the white dwarf and we're looking at it, that green beam is pointing straight at us. Mm -hmm. Half a spin cycle later, we're on the right-hand side of the white dwarf and the beam is pointing away from us, okay? So we'll get a, a big green pulse like the, the one on the bottom there. Um, I said earlier as well that synchrotron emission is also highly polarized. So it turns out that those black lobes that I've shown there, uh, the total intensity is the green lobe, but the polarized uh, emission is becomes double lobed. And this is the nature of the polarized and relativistic polarized emission. So the black curve at the bottom, you will get a double pulse um, from, from this model. Okay. So will the polarizing lab then be I mean, 180 degrees opposite to the each other. Yeah, so then, um, yeah, so then, um, you see the dashed lines, the, sorry, the dotted lines of the magnetic field. And so the magnetic field is telling you which direction the light will be polarized in. So as that whole system rotates, our viewing angle to those magnetic field lines will rotate by 180 degrees. And so therefore the corresponding measurement of the polarization will as well. Thank you. Okay. So if we, um, in the same manner as the real data I showed you a moment ago, let's put this model in the kind of the same graphical display, if you like, and that's what it looks like on the left. If we compare that to the real observations, so uh, between these two figures, you've got to compare, say, the top left one with the real observations on the other top left. Sorry, I can't point <laughs> to everyone else. So you compare that to that over there, and you can see we're not quite there yet, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, spot the difference, as it were, yeah. Okay, so back to the drawing board. And of course, so far, this is just a white dwarf on its own. But remember, it's in a binary system. Um, just off the edge there, I've drawn the, the binary system, okay? So there's an extra ingredient here. So you can imagine now that every time that white dwarf spins on the magnetic field lines pass by the, the M dwarf star, it gets a new influx of material off the, off the M dwarf. So the brightness of that, that green lobe is going to change depending on whether it's just past the end dwarf or, or it's gone a lot further on. Okay. Um, so I, I've done an animation for this. So now I've changed. So the two yellow lobes there represent the, the bright 
polarization lobes, okay? So I painstakingly drew this one frame at a time to try and display what's happening. So now you can see as the white dwarf magnetic poles sweep past the M dwarf, they pick up new material, and then there's a brief pulse of linear polarization as it goes by. And then as the particles have decelerated, they just go faint again until it spins around and picks up more material. Okay. So what you can see from this, though, is that those yellow pulses, they only ever point in that direction to where these numbers, 0.3, 0.4. So those, those numbers, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, represent the orbital phases. That's when our, that's when our viewing angle is at, at that. Any other phase, like 0 0.9, 0 0.8, the pulses are never pointing in that direction. So this model gives a more of a natural explanation of why you see pulses at one phase and, and not at other phase, and why they double pulsed um, as well. Okay, so back to the comparison just now. So this was uh, on the left again, the same plot I showed you a moment ago without the binary, without the other star in it. If I now put the other star in it, um, this is now what it looks like. So now we're, you can see we're getting a bit closer, right? So if you look at the main pulse on the far left and you compare it to the observations, you can see it's now confined to the orbital phase, but it also has reproduced that kind of diagonal structure to it as well. And similarly for the beat phase as well. And also the linear pulses now are double pulsed. So we're starting to recreate these kind of island features of the right orbital phase and the right spin phase as well. And as you pointed out earlier, we're still missing something in the middle there, but the diagram that I showed you a moment ago was only for one of the magnetic poles. Yeah. And there are two magnetic poles. So if I put a second pole in there, um, that's, that's where it goes. So now you can see um, we pretty much reproduced uh, all those characteristics um, in the observations. Okay, so that was AR SCO, and I was invited to come here today to talk about the new system, um, which is called, it just has a big telephone number, RXJ1920 minus something, 46 something or other. Um, so we discovered this one um, last year sometime. So ever since ARSCO was discovered, which is a rare type of system, it then became important, is this just a fluke one-off system or are there others like it? Because if there are others like it, then it now forms a class of systems. And then that gives us important information about adding to our understanding of how these systems evolve in general. Okay. And at the end, I'll tell you what vital clue that this uh, this now gives us. Um, do we know, so do we know how, how old the system is, the previous system, or what this system currently is? How old it is? Yeah, how old is being doing it in this traffic? We think it's, uh, oh, okay. Um, it's, we think, think it's quite old because the white dwarf is quite cool. And uh, it takes a long time for white dwarfs to cool down after they've been formed. Uh, but how long it's been in this state of this sort of emission, um, that's a bit more difficult to answer. And that would depend on understanding how these systems evolve, how the two stars slowly evolve over time, how their orbital period decreases and the two stars get start to get closer together. And maybe then accretion starts. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in these systems when accretion starts, right? There's no accretion going on here. Remember, it's the magnetic field grabbing material off the secondary rather than accretion. So yeah, so last year we discovered a second one. And uh, so on these plots, I'm just simply comparing ARSCO on the left with the new system on the right. You can see immediately the similarity in the features. The, the new system is a fainter system, um, so the quality of the data doesn't look as good as the other one, but you can see that there's the same 
kind of diagonal structures and the isolation of intensity and spin and orbital phase if space as well. Okay, so this is definitely um, the second one of this time. Uh, it has a similar orbital period and the spin period is about five minutes rather than two minutes. Uh, so uh, pretty much identical systems. And, uh, and we modeled this one as well, basically just used the model for AR SCO, adjusted a couple parameters, just basically it's inclination. Um, because in this system, it looks like, and this goes back to your comment earlier as well, in this system, it looks like most of the emission is only coming from one of the poles. The other pole is actually very hard to detect in there. I think we can just see it there, but it's, it's quite faint. Uh, so perhaps this one is uh, at a different inclination again, where only one of the poles is predominantly pointing at this and the other one is mostly pointing away. Um, okay, so this was this was the model again. Um, right, so this was the model. So then um, you remember earlier on where I gave an artist impression of what they think AR SCO looks like. So now we need to update that to what we now think it looks like from our additional observations of the polar imagery. Um, so I put this animation together. I hope it makes sense. So in the front here is is the is the M dwarf star. Okay, it started at phase zero, and in the middle is the rotating white dwarf. And you can see some of the material close to the magnetic poles of the of the white dwarf. So every time the white dwarf sweeps past the magnetic field lines of the white dwarf sweeps past the secondary. It grabs a load of fresh material, which then accelerates down to the white dwarf at these magnetic mirror points, which become bright. And then because it's synchrotron emission and it's accelerating and decelerating particles, the emission will be projected in the direction of the, uh, of the relativistic particles. So because they're falling towards the white dwarf, those beams of light are pointing towards the magnetic poles, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you can see as the orbit progresses, and I'll fast forward to a bit later. <laughs> so this is around phase point four. To remember from those diagrams at orbital phase point four, we got the brightest intensity peaks. So at this phase, you can see that pole in particular is now pointing straight at us. Uh, so you get these bright pulses. That's one pole, and then that's the other pole. Okay. And then if we skip forward to later, kind of 0.75, um, you'll see now that the, the bright emission now is generally pointing away from us, so it's not so bright as before. Um, okay, and that is the new, oh, so, right, <laughs> I forgot, I almost forgot one of the important points. <laughs> so, okay, so it's really cool that this is a rare type of system in itself, but now we've discovered a second one. It's obviously a class of object. Mm -hmm. So how, what clues does this give us about the evolution of stars in binary systems in general? And one of the remaining questions in astrophysics is why is it that there the white dwarfs in my, in binary systems there's a lot more of them that, are, that have high magnetic fields compared to white dwarfs that are isolated or on their own so why is it the binary system white dwarfs have more magnetized white dwarfs and isolated white dwarfs are generally not magnetized, or there's there's less of a fraction of them. So this type of system is now giving us new clues. Um, so earlier on, you had a question and about how old they are. So we've measured the temperatures of these white dwarfs, and we found them to be quite cool. So this these systems might be must be quite old. Uh, but then, 
uh, why is the white dwarf spinning so fast? Uh, so if the system's quite old, you'd expect things to slow down a bit. So what we think has happened is that earlier on in the life, this system was like the normal cataclysmic variables where there was accretion and the white dwarf was still hot. Now accretion then, because it's crashing onto the white dwarf, it spins up the white dwarf. So it was, there was an accretion phase in this system that caused the white dwarf to spin up. Now, because you now have a spinning mass, which is quite hot, you get this kind of, the theory is that it acted like a dynamo. So the high, the high, fast spinning white dwarf had a dynamo effect in it, which created the magnetic field in the white dwarf. Okay, the accretion spun up the white dwarf. And because now the white dwarf is spinning, there's a dynamo effect and that created the magnetic field on the white dwarf. You don't get accretion in isolated white dwarfs. They're not spinning so much, so there, was, so there was no opportunity for a magnetic field to ever be formed. So then as this system ages and it cools down, the whole white dwarf starts to crystallize, and that magnetic field gets permanently embedded in the crystallized white dwarf. And so we think this class of system, that's why besides being very rare, it's it's given us, I think, a big indication that perhaps this dynamo theory of why there are more magnetized white dwarfs in binary systems than there are in isolated systems is, is because of this. Good, I'm glad I remembered that one. <laughs> that was an important finding. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Steve, and I'm sure there are questions. So if anyone online has questions, maybe just unmute yourself and ask, and otherwise are there questions here in this room? I, I had one, if I may start then. Go ahead. Um, so were you actually actively searching for the second example, or was it the good luck? Uh, no, they are actively searching, and it was it was a, a coincidence. Actually, we had two separate groups um, that were searching for this. There was a German group that were using um, a new German, uh, a joint German and Russian space X-ray satellite that got launched a few years ago, and that was doing a survey of the sky for X-ray sources. So they passed us a list of potential x-ray targets for us to do optical follow-up on and then there was another group from the uk who were just looking at um the colors um they were doing a color selection based on observations from the gaia space satellite and they came with a list of objects to us as well uh, and coincidentally they both had the same object on, on this list and uh, so um yeah and then then we just discovered it to be polarized and so yeah <laughs> uh, who is we sorry we yeah so we is uh myself and um so generally my colleagues here in cape town um so it's myself david buckley uh patrick wrote at uct and uh, then um, and then the UK colleagues were uh, used to be Tom Marsh at the University of what uh, um, what University of Warwick in England, and then the German group were led by uh, actual Schwoke from uh, Potsdam University. I'm a stupid question. I'm just going to broadcast it out, but. Um, a dead white dwarf, because the white dwarf is actually a dead star, and it's yeah. ceased to be there, exist, just very hot. How can it be more powerful than a, a red dwarf, which is still an active star, and still have, have, have nuclear fusion and blah, blah, blah? So how can it actually be stronger? How can it, the white dwarf be stronger than a, a red dwarf of, of, by taking its... its yeah, it's mess. How do you? Uh, how well, you... you're right. A white dwarf um, is going to be a lot fainter compared to the M dwarf. 
Um, so, uh, uh, so that's true. But the, here it's in a binary system. So the brightness comes from the interaction between the white dwarf and the M dwarf. So the, the white dwarf is not so intrinsically bright itself. All that synchrotron emission that we've been talking about is not coming from the surface of the white dwarf or the surface of the M dwarf. It's coming from the magnetic field grabbing the material of the M dwarf, accelerating it to relativ relativistic speeds. That gets caught in the magnetic fields accelerates, decelerates, turnarounds and spirals. And that's what causes the bright synchrotron emission. It's that, it's that interaction. That sounds good. Thank you. And it's the same in the normal CVs as well. It's the accretion process that um, the release of energy as accretion material falls onto the white dwarf uh, that releases a lot of bright emission across X-rays and optical. Because remember, the white dwarf is only about the size of the Earth, but it has about the mass of the sun. So the gravity on the white dwarf is tremendously high. So anything falling towards that white dwarf is going to fall at a, at a high speed and then slam onto the hard surface and, and emit uh, high energies in that way. Interesting. Thank you. You have said that the magnetism of the white dwarf is locked in its crystal fracture. Yeah. What is the crystal fracture made? What's the main element in? Uh, well, it's a dead star, so it's probably mostly carbon and nitrogen and, and or on oxygen. That's a big diamond. So exactly, it's probably uh, well. It's but it will be much more dense than diamonds that we're familiar with on Earth, right? Uh, as I said earlier, if you if you manage to get a teaspoon of white dwarf material, it probably weighs about fifteen tons. Okay, so um, not good for rings. Not good for what? Rings. Rings, no. <laughs> the bride won't reach. The altar. Yeah. Sounds like a beautiful. Hello. It can be uh, electrons or ions, yeah, but it's mostly the electrons that um, will uh, give the synchrotron emission, but it, it can be both, yeah. Hello, I'm not quite sure how to pose this question, but um. Is there any um, consideration to the digital um, uh, instrumentation or reading and the analog product? Um, I was thinking with the polarization, um, is that related to digital at all or is it um, planar? Um, uh, with, especially with your graph with the the one graph uh, where it almost switches off and then it switches back on again. You've got a huge, um, you said, 40% difference um, right. in in a matter of an instant. Thank you, yeah? Yeah, so it's a matter of, inst uh, yeah, it's instantaneous because um, hopefully you can see from that animation that the, the direction in which the emission is beamed in is a very narrow beam. So as the white dwarf rotates, it's like a light. It's basically like a lighthouse. The 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 beam is quite narrow. So suddenly you go from zero to very bright in in half a minute. In in this case, um, I think I'm uh, answering your question. Unless there was some other part to it. Um, plenty more questions, but uh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. So are you you were uh, saying the the strength of the magnetic field that we're talking about. What sort of strengths are they say compared to the magnetic field of the sun? Um, well, it'll be easier to compare it to the magnetic field of the Earth because that's something we're more familiar with. So it's probably millions of times stronger than the magnetic field on Earth. So where on Earth, um, where here on Earth, you have a compass and the needle will. Yeah. We'll go, okay, I think if we replaced the Earth's magnetic fields with one of these white dwarf magnetic fields, I think we'll find all our cars on the streets pointing towards the North Pole. <laughs> Never mind your compass needles. So it's that that sort of strength. 
Well, there are no other questions. Thanks, bless you.